You're listening to the Technology for Mindfulness podcast, episode three, hosted by me, Robert Plotkin. Today, I'm going to be speaking with Dr. Judson Brewer, the Director of Research at the Center for Mindfulness at the University of Massachusetts, and the author of The Craving Mind, From Cigarettes to Smartphones to Love, Why We Get Hooked and How We Can Break Bad Habits, published last month by Yale University Press and with a foreword by John Kabat-Zinn. Dr. Brewer is an expert in the use of mindfulness to treat addiction, having combined nearly 20 years of experience with mindfulness training with his scientific research into the subject. In addition to his work at the Center for Mindfulness, he's an adjunct faculty member at Yale University and a research affiliate at MIT. In addition to his many publications, he has trained Olympic coaches and his work has been featured on 60 Minutes, TED, Time Magazine, and Forbes, among many others. Dr. Brewer has developed and tested novel mindfulness-based programs for habit change, such as his Craving to Quit program for smoking cessation and his Eat Right Now program for overcoming stress and emotional eating. We're extremely pleased to welcome Dr. Judson Brewer to the Technology for Mindfulness podcast. Hi, Judd, and welcome to the Technology for Mindfulness podcast. Thanks for having me. And you've just come out with a new book called The Craving Mind, From Cigarettes to Smartphones to Love, Why We Get Hooked and How We Can Break Bad Habits. I really love the title because most of us wouldn't normally talk about cigarettes and smartphones and love all in the same sentence. Uh, but what you describe is how the habits of mind that draw us to all of these things, to cigarettes, to our smartphones, even to each other, how all of these habits of mind stem from the same evolutionary and, and neurological sources and mechanisms. And although I definitely want to ask you about those mechanisms uh, and how all of these kinds of habits are similar to each other and how the clinical work that you've done with people points to the way that using mindfulness can help us break out of harmful habits and addictions. I thought it would be interesting if we could start by talking about you. Uh, you're a PhD, you're a psychiatrist. You know, How did you first become interested in exploring mindfulness, uh, both for yourself and for your use in professional work, helping people with addictions? It's a, it's a great question. So, you, you know, that, that kind of fuzzy uh, Malcolm Gladwell 10,000 hours rule where you, you know, you have to be, uh, do something for 10,000 hours to be considered an expert in it. Um, <laughs> I think one thing by the time I finished college, one thing I was an expert in was suffering. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I had logged a solid 10,000 plus hours suffering <laughs> <laughs> and, and that really prompted me to start looking at ways to, uh, to, <laughs> to at least decrease the mess that I'd gotten myself into. And did you see a connection from the beginning between your own uh, personal experience meditating and uh, your professional work? Or did that come later? Did you come to it initially just for your own benefit? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I, I actually started meditating my first day of medical school. And it was, you know, it was a transition for me. You know, I'd I'd been a very type A person through all through college and just push, 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 push. And, you know, I was starting at a, at a relatively uh, prestigious, you know, MD PhD program. So I was, you know, pretty worried about whether I would uh, be able to, uh, you know, hack it. Mm -hmm. Actually, is that true? Uh, good. I, yes, let's just leave it at that. Um, the, but really the, I started practicing because I was, you know, I was stressed out, uh, just, and I didn't really know why, you know, I loved medical school. Actually, my first semester was awesome because we were, you know, we were in anatomy and I loved, uh, I loved everything that I was learning yet. There was something there that was, you know, not, not quite right. And I had, you know, I'd gone through a, a bad relationship breakup and that might have contributed to it a little bit. But the truth was that I really didn't know my mind. I didn't know my mind at all. 
And I was trying, you know, as the saying goes, I was looking for love in all the wrong places in terms of trying to trying to fix that. So I really just started this as a personal journey uh, that I was just going to do, you know, as a self-improvement project as I went through medical school and no interest at all in combining this with what I ended up doing. I, I never thought I was going to become a psychiatrist. <laughs> that was the furthest from my mind. It's it's quite interesting because I think even people who don't have any experience with meditation or mindfulness might be able to see how you could use meditation to address your own stress in school. Mm -hmm. um, it seems intuitively like more of a leap to apply that to addiction, particularly things substance related like smoking or uh, alcohol or even food. You might think that... Uh, using your own mind might not really be enough to address something like that, which might have more of a physiological basis. So I wonder what what drew you or what gave you the initial insight perhaps to think about uh, applying mindfulness to addiction or what you call uh, harmful habit loops generally. And then, then after that, I wonder if you could talk about how you started testing out that hypothesis that mindfulness could be useful. Yeah. So the paradox is, you know, it only took me 20 years to figure some of this stuff <laughs> out. And, and it, you know, at the beginning, I was just I was just meditating and realizing, oh, yeah, I'm a little less stressed out. But I really didn't understand how it was working at all. And honestly, I think I, you know, I'm a pretty, I'm pretty hard headed. So I was just like, you know, my push, push, push mentality. I'd say, I'm just going to keep meditating. Mm -hmm. uh, what I know now is that if I had understood how my mind worked, it would, it would have been much, it would have made so much more sense in terms of how the meditation was actually beneficial. So I kind of fell into it because I was stubborn and just kept meditating and started realizing the benefits. But really, looking back on it now, I would say, boy, and this is actually how we how we teach it now, mm. is to say, well, let's first understand how our minds work, and then you'll see how the meditation works. So even starting with very short amounts of practice is a way for people to understand their minds more than you know sit down and meditate and, and bliss out for 30 minutes. Because most of us, if we try to sit down for 30 minutes, we're going to look and say, boy, that was terrible. I'm never going to do that again. Uh, so I think it might be helpful to start with just thinking about, you know, how our minds work. And this is where it gets super fascinating. This is a, it turns out that this is an evolutionarily conserved process that is all the way, all the way back to the most basic nervous systems known to man. So the sea slug, 20,000 neurons learns the same way as humans do in a certain way. Uh, Eric Kendall got the Nobel Prize for this. It, it, the process is called operant conditioning, associative learning, positive negative reinforcement. Most people have heard of these terms or even learned them in college because this is such a basic learning process. Well, for some reason in humans, you know, the, that was mapped out a little bit, but really hasn't been applied to treatment. And I, I blows my mind still why people haven't been jumping on this earlier because it's it's been around you know Eric and and to yeah. maybe to oversimplify it and tell tell me if I've gotten it right basically we're talking about uh, you're exposed to something positive that feels good like food and you eat it and you feel good and I'm, I'm trying to paraphrase from your book and you then learn to go back to food again to feel good and you experience something uh, painful you know a predator and you learn to avoid that in the future and is that that the basic kind of mechanism you're talking about yes yes approach avoid approach avoid so trigger behavior rewards so if we see food we eat it feels good we learn to eat more of it <laughs> if the predator comes chasing us we learn wow that's not so fun <laughs> Uh, so this is all reward-based learning. It's based on reward. So rewards drive behavior. And this is, you know, this is cupcakes, this is cigarettes, this is smartphones, this is romantic love. This is how our minds work. This is the most basic learning process known to man. That's that's really helpful to know. And so if it's so basic and it's it's enabled our species to evolve and succeed, then how does it go wrong? <laughs> that's the that's the million dollar question or or multi billion dollar question if your industries that that know how the system works and then can use it to uh to get people addicted to these things so how does it go wrong is you know our 
this the system's still at play when food is plentiful. So we don't really need to remember where McDonald's is because we can <laughs> we can look on our phone and or ask Siri, hey, where's the nearest McDonald's? <laughs> and it says, you know, turn left in four blocks and you will, you know, and then whatever. So the it, it's not a problem to remember where food is. In the Western world, food is plentiful. Yet our brains are still operating at this level. They're saying, oh, approach avoid, approach avoid. So they say, you know, oh, you're stressed out. Why don't you eat some food and you'll feel better? And so that that dopamine hit that we get from eating especially calorie-laden or sugar-laden food says, hey, that was a good thing because our brains, they don't care whether it's good or bad. They just register reward, 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 reward. So that's how they learn. It's a, it, on a very basic level. They're not saying that's good, that's bad. They're just saying do that again. Does that make sense? It does. It does. And I, I, it, I really found it helpful in the book when you said that initially you learn that when you're hungry and you eat, it feels good. Uh, and then again, uh, the next time you're hungry, your brain at a low level remembers that food uh, helped alleviate the hunger the last time. But then when you feel bad in some other way that may not be related to hunger at all, like mm -hmm. you're, you're depressed mm -hmm. about something, uh, your brain might remember that that food helped you feel good and, and somehow drive you to eat even though you're not hungry. Yes. Yeah, and I think we see this in modern day, so not just food. I think that's a great example, yet uh, we can extend this to social media. And there's been some great research, for example, with Facebook showing that we learn, you know, we learn to get the likes, right? So yes. the more likes we get, the, this is an intermittent reinforcement process. So we don't know when we're going to get a like. We don't know how many likes we're going to get. We don't know what, you know, how often we're going to get them. So our brain gets this intermittent reinforcement, meaning, you know, where, where there's a sudden like that we get or we go and check our Facebook feed and suddenly there are 300 likes when there were only 200 before our brain says, wow, that's awesome. So we learn, oh, Facebook's a good thing. So if we're not feeling so good, our brain says, you know, I'll cheer you up. Let's go check out Facebook. <laughs> and so it's the, it's the same process. There's two things I want to follow up there. One is I wonder if you can just explain to people, you just mentioned intermittent reward. And I wonder if you can tell our listeners a little bit more about what that is and just why it's so powerful, because I don't know that it's intuitively clear to people what is so strong about the force of intermittent reward. Yeah, it's not intuitively obvious, but it's so powerful that this is the, – the casinos dial in their slot machines to be the perfect intermittent reinforcement machine. So as an example, you pull the slot – and you don't know, you know, when you're going to get three cherries in a row or whatever, you know, gives you the jackpot. But it it pays out just enough so that people keep putting more money into the slot machine. Obviously, if it paid out more than it took in, the casinos wouldn't make any money. So this is a, you know, if you if you feed an animal on a regular schedule, say every second, being, you know, give you juice, 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 our brains become habituated to that. They say, oh, this is boring. I'm not learning anything. Yet if you say juice juice, 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 then there's this, you know, it's, it's always mixing it up and our brains are, you know, they're stimulated by, um, by surprise basically, mm -hmm. you know, when, when it's not a regular schedule, that's why they call it intermittent reinforcement. And that's been shown to be the best, the most reinforcing learning process because it, you get these dopamine spritzes in your, in your brain when you don't get it regularly. But when you get it regularly, your brain says, ah, boring. You know, I'm not learning anything here. I know I'm going to get food or whatever. Yeah, when, and when I read about this in the book, it made me wonder, um, you know, it, I, I might think intuitively that chemical substance like nicotine has got to be stronger, uh, stronger, have a more of a tendency to be addictive, let's say, than the internet. And it might be, or alcohol or something else. But... Um, I wondered if the intermittent reward feature of the internet and social media might give it a stronger pull in certain ways, particularly because of how social media and websites now are designed. I wonder if you could talk about that or give some examples of how, how intermittent reward is built into modern technology. Yeah. 
it's built in in very subtle ways, in many ways that I don't even know, and probably some of the industry is not talking about because it's trade secreted. But one one thing that has been documented, I believe, is that with with your Twitter feed. Um, they even set up this intermittent reinforcement schedule where you don't know when it's going to pop up, like when it's going to actually register. So it seems like, oh, this is just a delayed internet connection or something. But they actually uh, make it so that you get this intermittent reinforcement schedule that says, you know, it, sometimes it pops up quickly, sometimes it pops up a little more slowly. And that's a lot of that's actually calculated. Uh, you can actually – so that's just one piece where you can set up all these things where you're going to get some information, but you don't know even on a very subtle level when you're going to get it. And this can be subconscious even. But there are other pieces here. So for example, with social media, uh, it's a great opportunity to talk about ourselves. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it turns out that talking about ourselves activates the nucleus accumbens, which is the same part of the brain that gets activated when we use heroin or smoke crack cocaine or use amphetamine or you know something like this. So there's something rewarding about talking about ourselves. So that's added to this intermittent reinforcement process. And then you add to it things like gossip, which in itself – feels juicy. There's this exciting, you know, that's why we call it juicy gossip. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Literally, it juices our brain <laughs> when we, you know, when there's something like juice, you know, that we exciting about learning about somebody else. So you bring all these together and you've got this perfect storm, um, especially delivered by something that's always available. You know, so many people now sleep with their phones next to their pillows because it's like this, you know, it, it's it's more – they need it more than their teddy bear when they were a kid. You know? <laughs> yeah, you make a, a very compelling case for the uh, addictive quality of the internet. I, I want to follow up on that. I wonder if we could take a little bit of a step back uh, to to the work you had done earlier uh, related to other kinds of addictions like smoking and, and tell our listeners about how you learned to apply mindfulness, uh, what you learned worked, and why. <laughs> sure, I'd be happy to. And I'm even thinking of some of the pain and suffering that I went through <laughs> in, in doing that. So for example, when I was running my first uh, randomized controlled trial with smoking cessation, where we uh, randomized people to get mindfulness training or gold standard treatment, which by the way, turned out to be the mindfulness training was five times better than gold standard, which totally blew us away. We were mm -hmm. talk about intermittent reinforcement. We were not expecting that. <laughs> uh, but the first question I would get in my classes was, you know, have you ever smoked? Because these are hardcore smokers who on average w had tried to quit like five to seven times before. And obviously we're in our group because they hadn't quit. And so they're looking at me like, who's this, you know, who's this white male, you know, this white privileged guy <laughs> teaching me, you know, about my own addiction? You know, who is this guy? Where, where does he have any street value, your face, <laughs> you know, face value or face validity here? So I started, um, I, so cigarettes have in particular, nicotine has a half-life of, say, two to four hours, depending on our liver enzymes. Mm -hmm. And I, I had never smoked before. I'm, you know, I was addicted to plenty of other things, including running, which is somewhat antithetical to smoking. Mm -hmm. Although I have met, met a few runners who smoke, which I still can't fathom. But I started sitting uh, in meditation for two hours at a time. Not as a torture, you know, self-torture device, uh, but really to see what the restlessness feels like when somebody's trying to ride out a cigarette. I really needed to understand how strong these urges could be. And what I learned pretty quickly was, oh, my gosh, this is crazy. How did these guys do it? <laughs> By trying and, to sit, I think you said in the book, not just sit and meditate, but really remain completely motionless for two hours. Yes. So my, uh, my goal was not to move a, a, a hair for two hours. That was my goal. It took me months to work up to it. And when I finally did that, and it was actually not physical pain that would get me up. It was restlessness. It was really my restless mind that was craving all sorts of things like get up, get up, get up. Mm -hmm. uh, 
when I could really explore those sensations and see that they were simply sensations and urges that were driving me, I really felt like I had a much better handle on what the craving mind is like and what my own craving mind was like. And I could walk in there completely confidently uh, and work with folks who had severe addictions, you know, not just with smoking, but, you know, my other patients who had other severe addictions as well. And I, I challenged them. I said, look, I've never smoked. Uh, besides a couple of, you know, a couple of stogies here and there, you know, um, but if, if, if I can't convince you that I know what addiction is by the end of this group, call me out, you know, like the end of this session tonight, call me out and nobody ever called me out on it. Cause you know, a craving's a craving's a craving. And it, you know, I just, I did, I, I got to know it more in a way that uh, was less likely to cause cancer. <laughs> Yeah, and it 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 seems uh, still uh, uh, amazing and surprising that uh, your hypothesis that a craving is a craving turned out to be true in the way it was able to work with people who smoke. Because you might think that a craving to move while you're sitting uh, is just not as strong, or might even be qualitatively different than someone's nicotine induced craving to smoke, and yet. What you found was that, in fact, the same mindfulness-based techniques could be equally effective for smokers, even in the face of people who had been smoking for many years and had a, a real nicotine addiction. Yeah, that was absolutely true. That was absolutely true. I, I wonder, could you give uh, our listeners some examples of what kinds of mindfulness techniques you would uh, train people in when they were trying to beat smoking? That's a great question. So I didn't actually start with techniques to, you know, say, okay, we're going to jump in and write out cravings. What I started with was, and this actually came from very early psychology, like the earliest Buddhist teachings but that they had out there before paper was even invented. And the, the, the real thing that caught my attention was, I'll paraphrase, but it was basically, you know, it, they talk about exploring gratification to its end. Exploring, it wasn't until I explored gratification to its end that knowledge and vision arose or something like that. Hmm. And the idea, the idea here that was really that blew me away, blew me away, exploring gratification to its end. What they're talking about is reward based learning. So it's based on rewards. If we can't see our rewards clearly, we're never going to change our habits. So I started there, not because it was a great idea that I came up with, but it was like, well, these guys, <laughs> they seem pretty smart. Let's start there. So we started we started with just having people pay attention as they smoked and said, go ahead, smoke. And they looked at us like, are you crazy? I thought I'm trying to quit smoking. I said, no, 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 just smoke, just smoke. And they would smoke and their eyes would get wide and they'd be like, wow, this tastes like shit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I've had people come to me and say, you know, I've been smoking 40 years and I've never noticed this before. I've never noticed this. But the beautiful thing here is that this is our brain just recalibrating on its own without us having to do anything. We simply rest in awareness, pay attention to what we get from our behavior, so the cause and effect. And then when we see the rewards clearly, our brains recalibrate. So the reward, oh, this doesn't taste very good, helps us see, oh, this is not as rewarding as I thought. So we naturally start to become disenchanted with that behavior without effort, right? It's like pulling down on Santa Claus's beard, seeing that he's not Santa Claus. You can't go back and pretend that he's Santa Claus, right? It's like, okay, that's some old dude with a fake beard. So, yeah, and this, this is different than another technique you mentioned. You know, parents w might often, uh, if they see their kids smoking, make them smoke ten or twenty cigarettes in a row, and you know th that's a punishment-based uh, approach. It might result in the kid having that memory of the bad taste. But you're talking about something different, which is. Uh, refocusing your attention on even the single cigarette. Right, right. So this isn't the clockwork orange, you know, keep keep the guy's eyes open and force him to watch movies while you torture him. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that 
certainly can be helpful, but it, it really doesn't help us step out of that reward-based learning process itself It because you have to keep reinforcing that. It's an externally based reward. Here, we're just recalibrating our own internal senses, our own, uh, the own, our own rewards. So if we turn toward our experience and see very clearly, one, that cigarette you know, smoking doesn't taste that good, yet two, our own experience of being curious about what these cravings feel like is intrinsically rewarding, suddenly we win the jackpot because we are tapping into the same process, yet we're moving it from extrinsically driven or externally driven rewards to internally driven ones, ones that we aren't dependent on anything else. All we have to do is remember to pay attention. That's a game changer. And the reward you're talking about is the re the reward of satisfaction in in being curious and the experience of being curious, for example, about what this cigarette tastes like, even if the taste is not pleasant. Well, you tell me. So what is more pleasant, a craving or curiosity? <laughs> Certainly curiosity. It's why I'm why I'm interviewing you. <laughs> <laughs> so that so that answers it right there. And we can even we can even break it down to very simple experience. So cravings, if you had to put craving in a category of either expansion or contraction, what category would it would it fit into? Well, it, it can feel like expansion. You know, it certainly can feel like it's expansion. And it leads to, to another question I had based on something I felt was very provocative in the book which, and, and counterintuitive, which is this feeling that it can be expansive even when it's not, uh, yeah. which and I'm just going to quote from you in the book. Uh, we develop all types of learned associations that fail to address the core problem of wanting to feel better when we are stressed out or just don't feel great. I had to read that a couple of times uh, when I read it. I think it's related to your same question, uh, which is, uh, you know, I read it and I said, well, what is it about wanting to feel better or craving the better feeling? That's a core problem. I mean, isn't uh, many people might think that the craving or wanting to feel better isn't a problem. Maybe <laughs> the not having the better feeling is a problem. I, I, mean, I think this gets at, at the core of what you're talking about. Uh, yes. What is it about wanting to feel better when you're not feeling good that's a problem at all? Well, what does wanting to feel better feel like? Is that <laughs> satisfactory? Certainly not. Certainly yeah. not. So on a very basic level, it's unsatisfactory. And I would say there's this, well, you tell me if this is true in your experience and anybody listening to this can do this themselves as well. That wanting to feel better, is there, is there an underlying restless quality in there that says, do something, do something? Yes, there's certainly a restlessness. Uh, there yeah. can be an emptiness, you know, of a feeling of wanting to have a void filled. Yeah. Yeah. So that in itself is not stable because it says do something, make me feel better. So that that wanting to feel better in itself is an unsatisfactory state. So we try to get out of it. You know, we our brain says do something, go smoke a cigarette, go eat a cupcake, go check your Facebook, you know, go uh, date somebody so that you can have that, you know, that that excitement of meeting somebody for the first time or for that first kiss or whatever. And so I'll just keep playing devil's advocate here, which is uh, I agree the the wanting is is not a pleasant feeling, but uh, the pain or discomfort that I'm having that I want to escape is also not a pleasant feeling. So uh, not acting on the craving, uh, wouldn't that result in just a continuation of the unpleasantness that I'm having that I'm craving to escape from? I love that question. Yeah. So if the if we're not feeling good and it's and our brain says, do something, right? So we do something. That's our tendency. That's how our brains are set up. That's how we get into this mess in the first place. So we start doing stuff. So 
the problem is when, when we do stuff that just perpetuates the problem, <laughs> <laughs> then it doesn't, you know, we have to keep, you know, we keep going on Facebook more or we, you know, we become addicted to social media or we become an internet dating junkie. Uh, so these don't, they don't address the core root of the problem. They just make it temporarily feel better. So that core root, like you're talking about, is this unsatisfactory nature. And then, you know, so it, it can feel doubly bad at beginning, at the beginning when we, you know, quote unquote, do, don't do anything about it. Yet I would say we can do something about it in any one moment. But the doing is more of a being rather mm. than doing. So again, tapping into our internal mechanisms of reward, just getting curious. Oh, what does this feel like when I want <laughs> something, when I want to feel better? And we can tap into our experience right now and start to see, oh, there is something that even might be more stable that leads to um, a more stable feeling of joy and happiness, such as, you know, we often talk about equanimity. Mm -hmm. Equanimity is a lack of wanting, right? So no matter what's happening, we're not wanting it to change as much, you know, it, it can take a while before there's very strong equanimity. But for example, we're stuck in traffic and our brain says, boy, that's unpleasant. Do something. So we start honking or like acting like a jerk on the road. It doesn't, you know, that's not necessarily going to fix it. We're, it's just going to turn us into that guy that flicks people off or honks his horn in traffic. So what if instead we said, well, we can't fix our external circumstances so that wanting to make those external circumstances different is going to be futile because we can't – we don't have much control over those. Mm -hmm. What if we said – we flipped it on its head and said, OK, well, let me change my relationship to what's happening. Can I be OK with what's happening right now even if I'm stuck in traffic? Yeah, and that that's something that is that is stable. It reminds me you had – in the book, you you talked about it. Might have been you said the very first smoker you you interacted with, uh, who you asked about his own experience uh, uh, smoking in order to get rid of that craving or restlessness. Um, and I think you asked him the question. Uh, might have been about being in a car or on a plane where he couldn't do anything uh, about it. Uh, because I think his initial statement to you was that I have to do something about it or I'll keep having this feeling, this unpleasant feeling, this craving for a cigarette uh, forever, basically. Yeah. That was his fear. And I think it, it didn't turn out. Can you talk a little about that? Because it didn't turn out that way. <laughs> and I, it sounds like he really learned something from that. Yeah. Yeah. He So – you know, he comes into my office and he's like, doc, if I don't smoke, my head will explode. Right. <laughs> and so, um, not being, not having, uh, you know, not knowing what to say, I was like, okay, well, if your head explodes, then we'll, <laughs> we'll put the pieces <laughs> back together and we'll document this as the first case of head exploding from craving. So probably not the most funny or skillful response, but I didn't know what to say, but <laughs> it gave us the opportunity to really explore it and say, well, what does head exploding feel like? And let's walk through it. And we actually mapped it out on my whiteboard in my office. Oh, it feels like tension. It feels like tightness, burning, you know, mouth watering. And he could actually name the physical sensations that came together to form the concept of head exploding. Yet it gave him tremendous power to see that these were just physical sensations. And mm -hmm. so I was like, you know, is tightness head exploding? Will your head explode from tightness? Well, no, it's just tightness. And what happens to the tightness when you dive into it? Well, it, you know, okay, now there's there's mouthwatering. Okay, well, what about the mouthwatering? And we we just walked through it, and he could see that these sensations would come and go, and come and go, and come and go. None of them were head exploding. None of them stayed long enough, especially as he brought his curiosity to them. Yet at the same time, he realized he had so much more control, uh, paradoxically through not doing anything about his craving, but simply resting in awareness of it, that he could be with head exploding until it didn't feel like head exploding, mm -hmm. right? Cause it, it, it was, it was strong and then it was less strong and less strong. And then the craving was gone and he hadn't smoked. That's really powerful. 
Yeah, it's very, very powerful. And you you talked also, I wonder if you can explain about the, the different stages that people can go through. You have someone like that who on day one can experience some benefit but from, from not taking action and instead uh, resting in the awareness. But I believe what you described was that in that early stage, it doesn't necessarily mean the craving goes away. Right, right. And we even saw this in our raw data. So what people were learning was that these cravings come and go and that they feed those cravings by eating cupcakes or smoking cigarettes or whatever. Every time they used a substance, it was literally fueling the craving. And it's interesting if you look back at the ancient Buddhist psychology, this one of the terms for clinging, you know, when we get caught up in a craving the, the word is called upadana, which literally means sustenance or fuel. Mm. So that fuel was was feeding these cravings. And if they, they could learn that if they had a craving and they didn't fuel it, those cravings would become less strong over time. They would have less of a grip over them. So that cycle, that habit loop was starting to die off on its own. And we even saw this in our raw data in our smoking study. People had – they still had cravings, but they just weren't acting on them. And over time, you know, over about four months, uh, these cravings became you know, much, much less or much lower uh, in their ratings. And and I believe that that's a difference between your techniques for smoking and what had been considered the the best available alternative at the time. Is that right? Yeah, in that study, we got five times the quit rates. It was it was really remarkable. And and lower. I don't know if you'd call it recidivism uh, return. Yes. So we, at four months, uh, our folks were still at five times the quit rate of uh, the folks that had used the gold standard treatment. So less recidivism, definitely. Yeah. And I know one of the other alternative types of uh, approaches you talked about was substitution, which I think is, well, chew gum instead of, instead of smoking. You s- substitute something else. Uh, again, intuitively, I might say, well, chewing gum is much less harmful to my health than smoking, so why not? <laughs> and that is true. Chewing gum is less harmful than smoking. Uh, yet it doesn't it, – it treats around the core habit loop. So it just provides the substitute strategy, yet it doesn't help us dismantle or stop feeding the cravings in themselves. So instead of uh, breaking that habit loop, it just says, oh, you know, craving – chew gum, craving chew gum. Uh, the problem is, you know, if we run out of gum or something else happens really where we're really stressed out, our, you know, our brain is more likely to go back to smoking because it hasn't learned to dismantle and, and learn to handle those cravings in themselves. It just treats around them. It says craving, I know what to do as compared to let's really be with craving and not feed it at all, no matter what. Mm hmm. Yeah, I I know you know you've you've done very extensive work with with smoking. More recently, you have the um, Eat Right Now program for for eating. Uh, in your book, you talk about a much wider range of behaviors, uh, including uh, what I my listeners would be most interested in: use of technology. Um, mm-hmm. I wonder if you could talk, uh, maybe even give some examples of how people can apply the same basic principles or, or habits or practices to use of technology. I mean, I, I know younger people now aren't using email or phone as much. I still use the phone and email all the time and have to practice very hard not to check email frequently. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think email is a great example. So we just finished a clinical study with our Eat Right Now program, actually, where uh, people with stress and emotional eating uh, could reduce their craving-related eating by 40% within three months. So it was, you know, we're starting to see really remarkable change where we can tap into and harness this technology, you know, w- whether it's our phones or whatever, to actually help us unlearn these behaviors. Email is a great one, and it fits a lot with the things that we've been talking about. So intermittent reinforcement, if we get email, if we set up email reminders on our desktop or our phone, uh, they 
train us to to, <laughs> to start looking at our phone or our our computer whenever we hear that bing or the ding or or whatever that uh, alert is that says oh you've got mail uh incidentally there are several studies that have shown that that like just totally wrecks our brain <laughs> uh, and it and we can see this uh if anybody plays with just turning off their those alerts and checking their email you know every two hours or every four hours or something like that and just play with how much more productive we can be by just unitasking rather than multitasking because that multitasking myth has certainly become much more well known uh, as compared to, oh, yeah, well, our brains can multitask. No, they're really serial processors. They're not parallel processors. Uh, and that's that's been, that's been shown pretty well. So with email, for example, there can be a lot of things that are at play here. One is you know, this FOMO, the fear of missing out, whether it's email or it's the, you know, internet news, because we never know, you know, if, if we're going to miss out on some new news item that's really, that our brains think is really important. Well, we rationalize to think it's really important, but the truth is our brain says, oh, look for something novel, mm -hmm. <laughs> especially when we're bored or whatever. So that just even noticing the rewards that we get from checking our email all the time or being that slave to that email, you know, new email ding uh, is a great place to start to work with it. So we can see, you know, how uh, less productive am I when I'm doing this constantly? How much time does it take to ramp down, you know, my working memory from what I was doing to ramp it up to doing this email, then ramp it down again to go back to this task it's it's tremendously taxing and we can feel it if we're just constantly trying to juggle three things at once versus like just doing one thing and just doing it solidly like there's something that just feels really good about doing one thing at a time and being really focused on it so noticing the rewards like i talked about before reward based learning it's just like paying attention to when we smoke and then we can start to skillfully restrain ourselves so what's it feel like when i feel that urge to check my email <laughs> and what's it what's it feel like when i notice that urge and write it out wow i have I have more of a degree of control than I thought before. That in itself feels pretty good because I'm, <laughs> you know, I'm self-actualizing. If you want to think of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, uh, that's that's rewarding in itself. So there can be, we can just take these rewards and just pay attention. Well, what do I get when I multitask? What do I get when I'm constantly checking email? And what do I get, you know, if I'm in a conversation with somebody? And I'm not looking at my phone or I'm not looking over their shoulder to see who might be in the room that would be more interesting to talk to, you know, if I'm at a party or something like that. What's it like to have a real, true, genuine connection with somebody and really deeply listen to them when they're talking? That in itself is a gift that we can give and it's a gift that we receive when we really feel like somebody's listening to us, something that's unfortunately becoming less and less prominent in today's society. Mm -hmm. So if I'm understanding you correctly, I mean, going back to the, the very beginning of the conversation when we were saying we are fundamentally driven by rewards, you know, you're, you, you're taking that fully into account and just trying to uh, and, and acknowledging that that's who we are, that's how our minds work, but trying to shift uh, the focus so that we can use use rewards to our own benefit or to serve our own purposes. Is that a fair way of putting it? Yeah, I would say we can hack our minds. And I think, you know, why try to create something new or do something different. Let's just use what our brains know how to do best. Let's hack that system. It's, it's, to me, it's like, why wouldn't we be doing this? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm totally with you. I have one, another devil's advocate question, just because it's something I, I hear so often from people uh, as a response when I talk about uh, finding it hard to resist the, the craving or urge to check email or use the web. And the, the response is this, uh, you're just weak. <laughs> use, some, <laughs> use some willpower. And if you use your willpower, you can just actively resist, basically try harder. Yep. And I wonder from your perspective, uh, you know, what's what's the problem with that? <laughs> well, first, I would say, 
good luck. Go for it. <laughs> Let me know how it goes. <laughs> this is this is how all the all the weight management and the weight loss programs make all their money. They say just follow our point system. If you just follow, you know, keep your calories down, you'll lose weight. And if you can't stick to the program, you failed the program. It hasn't failed you. <laughs> so, and, and then, oh, and come back and try it again and, uh, you know, pay some more money. So <laughs> it's, you know, it's, it's very interesting to see how this is marketed in modern day. But the the truth is, you know, and there's it's controversial, but there's there's work on this showing, you know, there's a group. It's called like this willpower depletion. So, mm. and and this is it's obvious if we look at it at the end of the day, we're less likely to resist urges at the end of the day when we're tired than at the beginning of the day when we're not tired. So whether there's good solid scientific proof behind that or not, we can look at our own experience and see if that's true or not. So I would <laughs> guess for most of us, we're more likely to indulge in the things that we don't want to do at the end of the day versus at the beginning of the day. So there's something, you know, some people call this willpower depletion. Mm -hmm. And I love, there's a beautiful example of this in the movie Chocolat where, you know, the, the story is of this, this, uh, mayor of a town who gives up, uh, sweets for Lent, he gives up chocolate for Lent and then he's able to restrain himself and then he gets stressed out and it's like the day before Easter and he's so freaked out his prefrontal cortex goes offline and he just – he like breaks into the candy store and just like <laughs> – it just totally – pigs out on chocolate and you find him the next morning they show the priest coming up to the window and seeing him in horror as he's passed out like just co completely covered in chocolate so you know there's this you know if you were just stronger you'd do better sure there are a couple of people that are like mr spock and that's awesome they can they can totally roll with this just just do it and they're fine. But for the rest of us <laughs> where the that youngest part of our brain isn't as developed, uh, it's I, that's where I would say good luck because it doesn't work. Uh, so we could say, yes, you're just weak, 98% uh, of the population or whatever. And to that I would say, well, look, I'm a clinician. I need to find something that's going to work for more than 2% of my patients. And honestly, they're, they're not going to be my patients if they can use their willpower because they're not going to get addicted to anything. They're just going to say, oh, that's problematic. I'm going to stop doing it. So I wouldn't even have those folks in my clinic. So, you know, I'm a pragmatist. You mentioned the youngest part of our brain. I wonder, again, brings us back to the beginning of the conversation. You know, it, it sounds like you're, you're talking about... A, addressing uh, these problems at the level of the oldest part of our brains. Is that right? Yes, absolutely. Tapping into this reward-based learning process itself. Do you have any, any last um, suggestions, whether they be concrete or encouragements for, for our listeners when it comes to whatever cravings, habits, challenges they might be dealing with, with respect to, uh, technological habits uh, that they know are harmful to themselves or, or other habits, even if they fall short of addiction? So I'll start with an encouragement, which is uh, <laughs> don't despair. The, the human race is not lost. <laughs> and pragmatically, putting that in pragmatic terms, if we can map our own minds, we can tap into our own minds and you know, find the the joie de vivre, the, the the proverbial joie de vivre, that joy that comes with simply being, uh, simply by paying attention. So it's about starting with paying attention to what we get from our you know unhealthy habits, and then also paying attention when we pay attention to those habits and get curious about them. We can start to tap into that process itself. And what I would say is, as we tap into that more and more and more and find the conditions that support it. We even move into the territory uh, that Mihai Chicks and Mahai talked about as flow, which is selfless. It's effortless, immensely joyful. So I, I think there there is tremendous hope, and it's not about doing something or getting something. It's simply about mapping our minds and using that mind mapping as a way to retrain ourselves uh, in that way, tapping into our intrinsic rewards rather than looking for something outside of ourselves. Yeah, it's very, very exciting and motivating. I think anyone who's ever experienced that state of flow, even for a short time, knows how joyous it can be. Uh, and 
I know you've said to me before, I've enjoyed reading your books. I hope they keep coming. But I think you said that you're in the business of trying to put yourself out of business by giving people the tools that they need to do all of this for themselves. Yes. Uh, so these apps like the Craving to Quit and the Eat Right Now app, and we're actually just starting to, to put together an anxiety app as well. The hope is that we can make these things so good that people will learn these processes pretty quickly so that they don't need them. Uh, so I would be happy uh, to be in the business of putting ourselves out of business in terms of people, you know, really so where we optimize these so people learn them so quickly and learn them so well that they don't need them anymore. I would love that. OK, well, we would love it, but we'll, we'll want to keep having you back anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I would be happy to come back. And thanks for having me. It's been a real pleasure, a real joy. Same here. Thanks so much for, for being on. Thank you. Thanks for joining us for this Technology for Mindfulness podcast with me, Robert Plotkin, and today's guest, Dr. Judson Brewer, the Director of Research at the Center for Mindfulness and author of The Craving Mind, from cigarettes to smartphones to love, why we get hooked and how we can break bad habits. If you liked today's episode, please leave us a review on iTunes and share the episode with your friends. Those and all other links are in the show notes. Please join us for our next episode where I'll interview Susan Mousehart, author of The Winter of Our Disconnect, how three totally wired teenagers and a mother who slept with her iPhone pulled the plug on their technology and lived to tell the tale. I'm Robert Plotkin, and I'll join you next time on the Technology for Mindfulness podcast. 